And at that point, when they started proceeding down Elm Street, shots started being fired from behind. And I assumed that it was Mr. Nicoletti, because he was the one who was in the building, and I knew that Johnny Roselli was there. And uh, I remember the shots ringing out, and even though the president was being hit with the rounds, I was considering it a miss because I knew that we were going for a headshot on the president. And I had known he had been hit in the body, but I didn't know what part at that time. And I seen the body lurch, and I saw the body lurch again. I heard another shot that missed, and we were supposed to hit no one but Conley. I mean, no one but Mr. Kennedy. And I guess Governor Conley got hit with one of the rounds at that point. And I wasn't even sure of that because I was keeping Kennedy as best I could in the scope on the fireball. And when I got to the point where I thought it would be the last field of fire, I had zeroed in because if I waited any longer, then Jacqueline Kennedy would have been in the line of fire. And I had been instructed for nothing to happen to her. And at that moment, I figured this is my last chance for a shot, and he still had not been hit in the head. So as I fired that round, Mr. Nicoletti and I had fired approximately at the same time as the hit started forward, then it went backwards. Okay, my name is Jerry Croft, and I'm a professor of psychology at Santa Clara University, retired. And a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Conspiracy in Camelot. And it was called The Complete History of the Assassination. It was very academic, a thousand footnotes. Every mafiosi was listed. Every anti-Castro Cuban was listed. Uh, all the theories were presented, pro and con, including the Warren Commission. And um, I, you know, I wanted to make it as exhaustive and complete as possible. And Arthur Schlesinger was a historian he wrote a thousand-page history of JFK, never mentioned a single mistress of John F. Kennedy. Well, John F. Kennedy had 33 mistresses in 33 months, and they were not, he, Schlesinger said that wasn't relevant. To sleep with the girlfriend of the head of the mafia isn't relevant? Anyway, these are just some of Kennedy's uh, uh, liaisons in his time in office. And they were not just one-night stands. Judith Campbell went on a long time, Mimi Beardsley a long time, Mary Pinchot Meyer quite a number of months, and it could have been the last person to sleep with Kennedy. Uh, but there were one-night stands, too. Now, Kennedy was not particularly a good lover, uh, as uh, compulsive and addicted as he was to sex. Um, if you... Uh, Angie Dickinson, I think, said... Uh, it was the most exciting 20 seconds of my life. He didn't um, last very long, in other words. Um, if you look at a sample of men who cheat on their wives, 1% of that demographic have had more than five extramarital connections in a year. Kennedy had way more than that. So Kennedy is two standard deviations above the mean of men who cheat on their wives. Okay. Now, if we got a group of clinical psychologists together and said, is there a diagnosis for this now in 2018? I think he would qualify for having a hypersexual disorder. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that would be a very likely diagnostic assessment that Kennedy, in effect, had a mental illness. And that's hard for a lot of people to uh, accept. So anyway... Um, people said after that book, could you please write a book with ha that has just one theory, the best explanation for the Kennedy assassination? So this is a much shorter book. I condensed it and I said, this is the best alternate explanation to the Warren Commission. And LBJ was clearly indicted in that. I made a video this was written four years ago. The video was called The Kennedy Assassination, What Really Happened? And 715,000 people have watched that video on YouTube. They didn't buy the book, but they certainly watched the video. Now, um, I thought I was done with this. That was four years ago, and I said, I'm finished. And then along comes Donald Trump, who... Um, for all of his faults, actually did something good. He released almost 50,000 documents in November of last year and April of this year, just a few months ago. 
on the assassination. Some were previously known but redacted. Now they weren't redacted. Or the others, some others were never seen. I scanned, I swear to God, I scanned almost 50,000 documents. Had to get a new prescription. Uh, I didn't read them all. I skipped a few. I, I admit I might have missed some. But I swear to God, I looked at one and I said, oh my God, I didn't know that. And then I said it, oh my God, I didn't know that. And I wrote two books on Kennedy. And it was like one wow after another. So um, I apologize, but I wrote a third book. It's just out two weeks ago. It's called The Kennedy Assassination, What Really Happened. Same similar conclusion as Coup d'etat, but read the subtitle. A Deathbed Confession, New Discoveries, and Trump's 2017-2018 document release implicate LBJ in the murder. Okay, and I apologize. This is my third book on Kennedy. I could not stop myself after I heard all... There are eight, at least 80 huge revelations in this book that just came out. The media mentioned about six, okay? The media missed virtually everything. So I want to give you just, before we get into the substance of this, I want to give you just a few of the things that you say, oh my God, I can't believe that. Jack Ruby. We were told Jack Ruby had a strip club in Dallas, that he was familiar with the police, and that he shot Oswald because he didn't want Jackie to come to Dallas to testify. Thank you very much, Warren Commission. Okay? They didn't tell us a few things. Now, conspiracy researchers have done a lot of research on Jack Ruby. He was mafia all the way. He, he was arrested nine times. He, was, uh, uh, he knew Al Capone. Okay, this was not just a, a guy who owned a nightclub. And they whitewash his whole mafia background. But here's a document I come across in Trump's document release. They're kind of grainy, but take a look. An FBI informant is hanging out with Ruby. This has been withheld for 54 years. The informant stated that on the morning of the assassination, three hours before Kennedy was killed, Ruby contacted him and asked if he would like to watch the fireworks. He was with Jack Ruby and standing in the corner of the Postal Annex building facing the Texas School Depository building. Now, Kennedy landed at Love Field, drove 10 miles through crowds waving at him, and then ended up in this triangulated killing zone in front of the depository. Why didn't Jack Ruby just stand out there on the street so along those 10 miles and say, hi, Mr. President? No, he knew what was going to happen. He was aware. He said, you want to see the fireworks? And that's exactly what they had, saw. And he placed himself right there at the spot. Jack Ruby knew Kennedy was going to be assassinated. Nobody really knew that. Thank you, Donald Trump. Okay, that changes a lot of books that have been written on this subject. So there is another story that is a little bit, um, a little bit esoteric, but uh, stay with me because this is really important. So there's a man named Eugene Hale Brading, okay? And uh, he is spotted, I'm going to show you this, he's spotted at the Deltex building right after the assassination behaving in a strange, suspicious way. So he was reported to police. And he said his name was Jim Braden, and he just came in to try to find a public telephone. So um, they let him go. They didn't see any uh, criminal record for Jim Braden. Now, over the course of 50 years, conspiracists have uh, come up with a few th facts. First of all, Eugene Hale Brading was Jim Braden, and Eugene Hale Brading had a long criminal record, 30-some arrests. He was a convicted felon. He had connections to the mafia. And they, conspiracists, believe that he opened the doors of the Daltex building for an assassination team. Okay, that's the story. But um, the curious thing is that Donald Trump releases a, 11 documents about Eugene Hale Brading in November, six months ago. This is one of them. Uh, Brading is arrested in 1953 for fraud. This is one of his many convictions. So 
why the question is why would the government withhold the re criminal record of Eugene Hale Braiding for 60 some years why well probably because the government wanted to perpetuate the myth that just a passerby named Jim Braden wanted to use a phone in the Deltex building instead of a convicted felon with mafia connections. So uh, Jim, Jim Braden, Eugene Hale Braden, changed his name legally to Jim Braden two months before the assassination. So I guess he would have nice clean ID in case anybody stopped him. So that, that to me was like, wow, another one of those revelations. Now this is going, to, this blew me away. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures here, but this story, I wrote two books on the Kennedy assassination and never knew about this. Some parts of this story were known, but uh, this was completely new to almost everybody. Uh, Eugene Dinkin and David Christians. So Eugene Dinkin uh, is a cryptographer in Germany. He's a, a US army soldier, obviously must have a security clearance, if he's a cryptographer, Eugene Dinkin uh, deciphers coded messages. That's what he does. And he comes upon messages that indicate that President Kennedy is going to be assassinated. This is the first week of November, almost three weeks before the assassination. He's in Germany and he hears the name William Harvey. William Harvey is a CIA operative who's in charge of assassination procurement for the CIA. And he hears the name Guy Bannister, who is also in a, a, a New Orleans CIA, FBI, alleged conspirator. So uh, he says that John Kennedy is going to be assassinated in Texas on November 28th, six days later than he actually was assassinated. But it was in Texas. And it would be blamed on either a communist or a Negro. Well, it was blamed on a communist. So he tries to write Bobby Kennedy this information and through a friend and he decides it's not likely to get to him. So he abandons his post in Germany, goes to Switzerland, to Geneva, to the United Nations press briefing room, and tries to tell his story. The US Army arrests him for deserting his post, puts him in a mental hospital for six months. I never heard that story before in my life. There's a man who knew it was a CIA plot that he discovered three weeks before the assassination. He's alive somewhere, I believe, but I couldn't find him. David Christensen is another soldier in a different place. They redacted where he was for many years, but now we find out he was in Scotland in a CIA listening post in Scotland, and he also heard chatter earlier than Dinkin, early in November, that uh, the CIA was planning uh, a hit on Kennedy. He told his friend, guess what? He was also arrested and put away as a mental patient. Seriously. Now, here's the document, a grainy document about Eugene Dinkin. And that arrow points to the fact that on November 6th and 7th, um, he was at in Geneva trying to tell his story at the UN press briefing room. So these are very, very strange and incriminating stories. So I said uh, uh, earlier that... Um, a lot of people have criticized me for not telling them how to buy my book. So there's the book. Go to the URL uh, at the description page and uh, you'll go right to Amazon. Uh, I was talking to my graduate classes at Santa Clara University a number of years ago about Kennedy for some reason. And I noticed these are people who are bright, 23 to 30 years of age, graduates of UCLA, Berkeley, high GPAs, very intelligent. And when I was talking about, I noticed some blank faces when I mentioned Jack Ruby. And I said, do you know who Jack Ruby is? And about 20% didn't. And I said, you don't know who Jack Ruby is? And then I realized, wait a second, these people, um, this was ancient history to them, right? It happened 25 years before they were even born. So here, let's t retell the story that they teach in our elementary schools, okay? This is the Warren Commission cover story. I don't think it's true, but this is what everybody was taught. And so let us go through it. So we have at least the basic fundamental facts. John Kennedy is driving. The, usually the presidential limousine travels at 40 miles an hour to, to avoid snipe. But this presidential limousine made a sharp right turn and then a sharp left turn, almost came to a complete stop 
entered this triangulated killing zone. Kennedy was driving, a, I mean, he was traveling about 11 miles an hour when he was uh, shot and killed. The three shots came from the depository, so says the Warren Commission, all from a man named Lee Harvey Oswald, a Marxist, Leninist, communist, uh, lone assassin. Now, uh, the first bullet hit the curb, the second hit bullet allegedly hit Kennedy, the third bullet hit Kennedy in the back of the head and killed him. There were no other bullets, no other assassins, no other conspirators, only Oswald, uh, and he's the only person. Now, Oswald was in the depository allegedly, and he left in somewhat of a paranoid place, he took a cab and a bus, got to his house, picked up his revolver, and went towards the Texas theater. He was confronted by an officer named Officer Tippett. He executed Tippett in cold blood, pumping a number of bullets into his body, then he went towards the Texas theater. He had $13 in his pocket, but he didn't buy a ticket. His behavior was suspicious. They came, they arrested him. Prior to the assassination, Oswald allegedly left in late September for Mexico City, and he banged on the desk of the Cuban consulate and on the Soviet embassy saying, I want to get out of America with my family. I want to go back to Russia. I need a visa to Cuba and then to Russia. And he made a big stink, and everybody remembers uh, or supposed to remember Lee Harvey Oswald. That's part of the, the Warren Commission mythology. Now, um, uh, 48 hours after his arrest, he, he had been questioned for two solid days, but no tapes were ever made of those interrogations. And Jack Ruby shot him in cold blood. And that is the Warren Commission story. Now, uh, can we now start? This video is called What Really Happened. So, uh, we have, we're going to introduce completely new information here. And uh, probably the biggest discovery of the 21st century is coming. So get ready for it. All right. So November 8th, 1963, Oswald writes a letter. Dear Mr. Hunt, I'd like more information concerning my position. Hey, Lee, you only work in the depository for a buck and a quarter an hour. What do you mean your position? I'm asking only for information. I'm requesting that we discuss the matter fully before steps are taken by me or anyone else. Uh, steps are taken? Who are you writing to, Mr. Hunt? You are involved with somebody and you don't know what you're involved in. You want more information. Now this letter uh, surfaces 12 years after the assassination. It comes anonymously from Mexico to a journalist named Penn Jones and copies to two others. So it goes to the House Select Assassinations Committee, and they said, my God, this is interesting. And they, Marina Oswald said, that's my husband's handwriting. And one handwriting expert says, I'd go to court, that's Oswald. But another handwriting expert said, I'm not so sure. And a third handwriting expert said, I don't think that, I think that's a fake letter. So the House uh, Assassinations Committee lost interest in this letter. In the meantime, a, he misspells a word. This is the clue. He misspells the word concerning, and he spells it concerning. Pay close attention. Now, in the meantime, a Soviet defector steals documents from the KGB, defects to the West, uh, lives in Britain the rest of his life, and reveals the secret history of the KGB. And he said, with a, a, a historian named Christopher Andrew, that... That letter was concocted by the KGB. A lot of people believe that. It is totally, utterly false. Okay? You'll have to read my book to find out why. But it's a, an utterly false room. So, I was a psychologist when I first started my career. I specialized in learning disabilities. Learn Lee Harvey Oswald was smart, but he had severe dyslexia. He misspelled a lot of words. Okay? He misspelled concerning. Now, if you're going to fake his handwriting, one thing, but are you going to fake his dyslexia? When he wrote the word Moscow, he spelled it Macau. When he wrote the word desire, he spelled it desire. When he wrote the word necessary, he spelled it neckery. Opinions were opiums. Oswald had very severe dyslexia. So I thought, what if I could find that Oswald misspelled concerning, concerning, 
in something else that he wrote. This would be a great discovery. That's what I thought. So I went to the Warren Commission. They corrected all of it. They published everything, but they corrected his spelling and his punctuation. Thank you. But there was a woman named Diane Halloway who wrote a book on Oswald, publishes all of his writings with all of the punctuation and misspelled words intact. And I'm searching for the word concerning. And there it is. Okay. He wrote a letter in 1961 to the American Embassy and misspelled the word concerning. Now, just you have to think, what does that mean? That means an awful lot. That means Oswald wrote that letter, okay? That means Oswald was in the dark. That letter was written 16 days before he was murdered. He was involved with somebody. He wanted to know things before steps were taken by him or anybody else. He's, somebody else is going to take steps. Who's Mr. Hunt? One thing you can certainly take to the bank, and that is that the Warren Commission was wrong. All these books that say the Warren Commission was right, Gerald Posner, Bill O'Reilly, Vincent Bugliosi, that Oswald acted alone, they're false. Okay? All 26 volumes of the Warren Commission become disinformation. All right? Because Oswald is, he did write that letter. And he was involved with somebody. And the, the idea that he wasn't is false. It's a big story. Now, there are a lot of people who felt the Warren Commission was not true. These are intellectuals, Thomas Merton, Norman Cousins, Bertrand Russell, Charles de Gaulle. They thought it was a whitewash. Uh, Hale Boggs was on the Warren Commission, and he thought it was a lie. Senator Sherman Cooper and Richard Russell also didn't buy it at all. Uh, JFK's personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, thought it was malarkey. Kevin E. Aides, David Powers, Kenneth O'Donnell didn't think it was true. Secret Service officer, Gabby Kellerman, didn't believe it was true either. John Connolly was asked, uh, do you think Oswald fired the bullet that hit you? He said, absolutely not. I do not for one second believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission, governor of Texas. And the American people don't believe it either. In 2011, there was a poll, 75% of the American people do not believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission. It was a whitewash. So the question is, uh, will the real Mr. Hunt please stand? Let's follow our clue. Who is Oswald writing to? Who is, nobody, no Mr. Hunt ever said, oh, he was writing to me. <laughs> nobody did that. So there are two major suspects here. The first is, H.L. Hunt, or one of his 14 children. He was the richest man in America. He didn't like Kennedy, neither did, did his son. They thought maybe it was H.L. Hunt. That, uh, that Why would Oswald, the, working for a buck and a quarter an hour, be writing to the richest man in America? But some people, serious-minded people, believe that's true. Well, I discovered a memo written uh, it's from Trump's data release, one of those wows. Paul Rothermel was Hunt's chief of security, and he discovered that there would be violence along the parade route a few weeks before Kennedy was assassinated. And he writes a memo to his boss saying, I think there's going to be violence. And then he sends a copy of this to the FBI and the Dallas police. Well, if Hunt was planning on killing Kennedy, his chief of security just spoiled the whole thing, didn't he? Because he just informed the FBI, just informed the police, and just informed Hunt that uh, this was going to happen. I think the Paul Rothermel memo exonerates Hunt. Now, other people may disagree, but I think he wrote the memo, and it certainly would have spoiled any secret conspiracy Hunt was planning on if he learned that, my God, my chief of security just told the Dallas police this is going to happen. So the second Howard Hunt is the Howard Hunt of the CIA. He's known for Watergate. He was arrested at the Watergate. He worked in the CIA and then retired. Okay. People say, you really look like somebody who was at Daily Plaza. He denied it his whole life. So Howard Hunt wrote 70 books. Fuck fiction. He was a good writer. But he was a CIA spy, too, and he helped overthrow the government of Guatemala with his friend David Phillips. 
Hunt denied he was ever in Dallas, denied he had anything to do with it. But he had a son whose name was St. John Hunt. Strange name for a son. But St. John Hunt lived in Northern California. His dad was dying. He was 88 years old. He flew to, to Florida. His dad just published a book called American Spy, in which, again, he denies everything. He talks about his career in the CIA. But the son says, Dad, are you going to tell me what really happened? And his father opens up to him and starts telling him what really happened. It is the most dramatic deathbed confession in the whole history of the Kennedy assassination drama. Uh, and yet, he said, I'm not going to tell you what I did. Okay? I'm not going to get you in trouble or my wife or any of my family in trouble. So... I'm not going to tell you my involvement, but I will tell you what happened. Here is an excerpt of his deathbed. By the way, the son is taking notes, making a videotape, putting it on YouTube. He's a brilliant man. I was on the radio with him, St. John Hunt. He really knows the Kennedy assassination backwards and forwards. Here's an excerpt. Five. I heard from Frank that uh, LBJ had uh, designated uh, Cord Meyer Jr. to... Uh, undertake a larger organization while keeping it totally secret. I think that uh, LBJ settled on uh, Meyer as, a, uh, as an opportunist, Perrin like himself, a Perrin, and a man who had very little left to him in life ever since JFK had, uh, had taken Cord's wife as one of his uh, mistresses, I would uh, suggest that uh, Cord Meyer welcomed the approach from LBJ, who was, after all, only the vice president at that time. Okay, so uh, remember one of those mistresses named Mary Pincho Meyer. Uh, Kennedy, uh, I think, fell in love with her as she was with him in the last year of his life. Uh, she was ultimately murdered 10 months after Kennedy. He uh, says that he thinks that Cord Meyer, of the C very few conspiracy writers talk about Cord Meyer at all, but he was a high up CIA official. He said LBJ planned to kill Kennedy, used Cord Meyer to, Cord Meyer to set it up. So that forms the basis of my book. Uh, I follow his confession, but I add other things to it too. We're interested in what really happened. And I believe that his confession is very important. So his conspirators are first Linda Johnson, Cord Meyer, William Harvey of the CIA, David Phillips of the CIA, a Corsican hitman that was also mentioned by Eugene Dink, David Morales, a CIA hitman who worked out of Angleton's office, who was Cord Meyer's boss, Antonio Vessiana, and Frank Sturgis. Okay, I want to first... Talk about the mastermind, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So there's a book written uh, about Lyndon Johnson as the mastermind. Pretty good book. Um, there were three scandals that were operating uh, in 1963, and Johnson was in hot water. <clears throat> These were part of his prior psychopathic behavior. Uh, the Bobby Baker scandal, the Billy Saul Estes scandal, and the Fred Horth scandal. Um, uh, they were considering investigating Lyndon Johnson's ethical behavior. Uh, um, Bobby Kennedy wanted to get him off the ticket for 1964. He was in deep trouble. He did not like JFK, and he particularly did not like Robert Kennedy. So um, during the Billy Saul Estes case, Billy Saul Estes was um, arrested and charged with fraud and uh, there, Johnson's fingerprints were on it. And um, Bobby Kennedy said, if you implicate Johnson, he'll get him out of prison. He was the attorney general. He could have done that. Billy Saul Estes said, if I did that, I'd be dead in 24 hours. Lyndon Johnson was not someone to mess with. All right. Formed a criminal investigation of Lee Harvey Oswald and determined him to be a murderer without a motive. If you take all of these other possible parties who could have killed the president and combined all their motives together, they wouldn't have as many as Lyndon Johnson himself. He had personal motives, he had economic motives, he had political motives. We start with motive. 
Then from there we go to opportunity. Lyndon Johnson was involved in planning the trip. Yeah, he planned the trip. Uh, but before we get into that, he uh, was so panicked by the scandal that was happening with Billy Saul Estes and Bobby Baker, his number one associate, he and Johnson had done some really good deals. Now, I can't read this to you. He walks, Johnson walks into a senator's office. There's a lobbyist present. Um, he doesn't even recognize the lobbyist. He's in such a, a fury. I'm not going to read the expletives here, but I'm going to give you a, a sense of his panic. John, that's the name of the senator, that SOB, Bobby Baker, is going to ruin me. If that blah, blah, blah talks, I'm going to land in jail. I practically raised that blah, blah, blah. And now he's going to make me the first vice president of the United States to spend the last days of his life behind bars. Now, this profanity goes on for a little longer. You can read it in my book. According to one LBJ biographer, if Jack Kennedy had not been murdered, the Bobby Baker investigation would have would not have ended. If Jack Kennedy had not been murdered, the Baker scandal would have either destroyed or tarnished Johnson's image so completely that he would not have been on the 1964 ticket. And that would have been the end of his political career. If the president had not been slain, the truth about LBJ may have, may have put him in prison, as his grandma predicted, rather than into the White House. So Johnson was in hot water. He left Washington, went to Texas in October, planning the trip and staying out of Washington, D.C.'s limelight. He had a mistress. Her name was Madeline Brown. The night before the assassination, he was in a secret meeting, and uh, he stormed out of that meeting, and this is what she said. Let's go back to the night before, when, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry. He had a violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you. What did he say he, to he, you? Uh, he grabbed me by the arm, and he had this deep voice, and he said, After tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. And it, it startled me, really, you know, because he was so ruddy-faced. I thought, oh, well, he really, uh, something went on that shouldn't have gone on. And there were violent feelings that have never been told that was between those two people. So um, let's now go from LBJ, assuming that the motive is there, uh, to how he did, how he did it. According to Howard Hunt, uh, his choice from the CIA was Cord Meyer. Cord Meyer was a very high up CIA official, um, uh, and he worked under James Angleton. Cord Meyer was married to Mary Pinchot Meyer, who, as you saw earlier, was one of Kennedy's mistresses. They flirted in the 1940s. Cord married her, didn't like Kennedy at all. Uh, and they had a very bitter divorce. And then uh, in the last year of Kennedy's life, she took up with John Kennedy. And um, she was actually murdered, execution-style murder. At any rate, Cord Meyer is, the, uh, is Hunt's major CIA functionary who's uh, planning this secret operation, which is called the Big Event. Now, his boss is James Angleton, who was a very suspicious character. One guy said he was the most sinister-looking person I've ever met in my life. Uh, he had 200 people working for him in the counterintelligence department of the CIA, always looking for snoops, bugging people, finding out lots of things about people, and uh, doing uh, and uh, hiding documents. There's a lot of evidence that James Angleton was, ne was not forthcoming to the Warren Commission or anybody else. Now, he was dying of, he smoked cigarettes, was dying of lung cancer, and um, he didn't make a deathbed confession, but here are his words as he's coughing, cl coming close to death. The better you lied and the more you betrayed, the more likely you would be promoted. I did things that, in looking back on my life, I regret. Regarding Alan Dulles and Richard, Richard Helms, these were CIA directors. These men were the grand masters. If you were in a room with them, you were in a room full of people that you had to believe would deservedly end up in hell. Angleton took another slow sip from his steaming cup. I guess I'll see them there soon. So I think the man had a bit of a guilty conscience. So Johnson could not do this 
alone. He had to eliminate Kennedy to save his political career to prevent himself from going to jail. So he used CIA functionaries, James Angleton, Cord Meyer, William Harvey, David Phillips, David Morales, everybody but Angleton was mentioned by Howard Hunt. And these people, in turn, dealt with assassins and the mafia, Sam Giancana, Johnny Rosselli, James Files, Nicoletti, Richard Kane. So that's how this plot unfolds. But the important ingredient here is the person that Eugene Dinkin overheard, William Harvey. He was had his own division in the CIA, and he was in charge of assassin procurement. He hated JFK, but he really hated Bobby Kennedy. He, was a, he hired assassins to attack Castro on various operations. He carried a gun with him everywhere he went. Okay. He was an alcoholic, and uh, some people thought he was a psycho. He had a very close friend named Johnny Rosselli, who was in the mafia. William Harvey's kids called Johnny Rosselli Uncle Johnny. Johnny Rosselli was a dandy. He was from Hollywood. He knew Hoffa, Traficante, Marcello. He knew all of the mafiosi. He was the man who made the deals and made sure that, like when Kennedy wanted to assassinate Castro, they worked through Harvey and Rosselli. Well, this is an operation that involves the big event, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, there were lots of mafia, well, I mean, Robert Kennedy had put 700 mafiosi in prison in three years, okay? And um, the mafia was in a state of panic that he was, uh, Robert Kennedy was destroying organized crime in this country. This is what Carlos Marcello in, in New Orleans said. Don't worry about that little Bobby son of a bitch. He's going to be taken care of. The dog will keep biting you only if you cut off its tail. But if the dog's head were cut off, the entire dog would die. Santa Traficante said, Mark my word, this man Kennedy is in trouble, and he's going to get what's coming to him. He's going to be hit. They wanted to hit the president because if they hit Bobby, the president would destroy the mafia investigating his brother's murder. But it wouldn't work the other way around. And here is G Giancana's brother writes a book about Sam Giancana after Giancana's dead. It's a very important book. It's called Double Cross. We took care of, this is what Sam Giancana said. We took care of Kennedy. The hit in Dallas was just like any other operation we'd worked on in the past. The United States had a coup. It's that simple. The government of this country was overthrown by a handful of guys who did their job so damned well, only one American ever knew it happened. Okay. So this is the syndicate in Chicago, the major syndicate people, Sam Giancana, Santos Traficante, Carlos Marcello, Tony Arcado. But from Sam Giancana, we see here are the hitmen. And three of them, uh, of four of these four guys come out of Chicago. Nicoletti, Richard Kane, James Files. Johnny Rosselli was not a shooter. He was not, he was there kind of to supervise, but he was not a shooter. Those other three guys were shooters. So this is roughly the high cabal and how it uh, operates. Johnson uh, develops the plot. The CIA figures are there. The most important is William Harvey, Cordbinder, and Angleton. And Dulles and Helms, we are not exactly sure how active they were in this. We do know they played a role in lying and disinformation and destroying documents, but we don't know how active they were in the plot. But Harvey and Rosselli is the key ingredient for linking the CIA to the mafia and to the syndicate, which really wanted Kennedy gone. Now let us take a pause and start looking at Lee Harvey Oswald's behavior from, Dal from New Orleans to Dallas. I'll, so we're taking a pause here. There's 50 years of research here. So we know just about every cup of tea Oswald drank. Oswald moves to New Orleans in April of 1962. Um, his wife Marina goes to Dallas in September. Oswald arrives a couple, a, a little bit later to Dallas. Now, Oswald is work, working in a place as a greaser of machinery, and he's got a friend across the street named Adrian Alba. He, Adrian Alba is running a garage, and there are a lot of Secret Service FBI cars there. 
Oswald's fired and he comes out and he's kind of got a smile on his face. He says, I found my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And we've kind of wondered, what did he mean by that? Well, we think that he came in contact with Guy Bannister in New Orleans, a, a right-wing John Birch Society, former FBI man, who now we learn was a CIA asset. And he starts doing political things. He starts passing out leaflets, fair play for Cuba. He's the socialist, the Marxist, the controversial figure. He gets in a fight with an anti-Castro Cuban named Carlos Bringer. They get arrested together. He gets bailed out uh, by a mafiosi, uh, a person related to a mafiosi. And then he uh, doesn't uh, learn his lesson. He starts passing out more leaflets in, and, and continues this from July 19th to August 19th. Trouble is, his leaflets, Hands Off Cuba, have an address stamped on them, Camp Street, which is the same address as the office of the right-wing Guy Bannister. It's also in the same building that Howard Hunt has, an, has a group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles. So Oswald, the left-wing Marxist, is operating in, a, in an environment of right-wingers. Now, remember, Eugene Dinkin said Guy Bannister was involved in the assassination, and so did a couple other people. Bannister dies, of course, within a year of Kennedy. Um, so uh, the people here, the intermediaries in New Orleans are important. David Ferry uh, was an anti-Castro person who really wanted to see Kennedy killed. He knew Carlos Marcello. Marcello he worked for Guy Bannister. He knew Harvey Oswald. But some of the Warren Commission people like Gerald Posner said there is no proof that David Ferry ever knew Oswald and therefore there is no connection. Well, indeed, there is proof. Plex, you're going to need to read my book here because it's very complex. I can't render this and make it simple in a video. But there's a picture of Oswald at the age of 15 with David Ferry in the Civil Air Patrol. Yes, indeed, they knew each other. And Ferry was a right-wing anti-Castro person connected to the Mafia who knew Oswald, and there is no doubt about it. Delphine Roberts said, quote, Many times when he came into the office, he used the private office behind banisters, and I was told he was doing private work. I believed his work was somehow connected with the CIA rather than the FBI. So Oswald's deeply involved in something in New Orleans in July and August of 1963. Ferry, uh, after the assassination, David Ferry worried that he had lent Oswald his library card. He goes to Oswald's landlady and tries to retrieve his library card. And Oswald's landlady won't wouldn't let him in. We don't know if he uh, ever retrieved it. The Warren Commission never came up with a library card. So Oswald's involved with something in New Orleans. Now I'm pausing here to, to remind you, this is a complex part of the story. This is where you need to read the book. All right. Now I want to show you the wows that I got from this New Orleans Dallas period. And every, I mean, I looked at it. I said, my God, I never knew that. And I did a lot of research on this myself. Here comes a wow. Okay. There's a, a bar owner named Oresta Pena in New Orleans, okay? After the assassination, he testifies in front of the House Select Assassinations Committee in the 1970s, and he says that he saw Oswald meeting with an FBI agent named Warren DeBreez. That's a very old, recent picture of DeBreez. you got to imagine him 50 years younger because... Um, he didn't look like that in 1963. I couldn't find a, a younger picture of him. So he said, yeah, uh, Oswald was meeting with this, uh, with this Debris a lot. They, they knew each other well. And Debris threatened me, he said, I didn't want me to testify. And when Oswald moved from New Orleans to Dallas, Debris followed him to Dallas so believe me that he was either an FBI informant, he was doing something with the FBI. Now, he talked like a barroom owner, Arresta Pena. Now, the HSCA, the committee that investigated, also took testimony from the FBI and the breeze. No, no, I never knew Oswald. 
never had any connection with Oswald, never threatened Mr. Penna, and I never went to Dallas until after the assassination. I was asked to go to Dallas after Kennedy was shot because they needed extra FBI people in Dallas. That's what they said. The committee believed him, did not believe Penna, end of story. Bye bye. But then Trump releases a document that is going to knock your socks off. This is the document released in November. It is, it is requested that this case be reassigned inasmuch as the agent to whom this case is assigned at present will be absent from the New Orleans office on special assignment at Dallas for an indefinite period. Well, Warren DeBreeze is going to Dallas, okay? But look at the date of this memo. It's, November, it's October 25th. It's a month before Kennedy is shot. He is going to Dallas right after Oswald goes to Dallas. And he's not going to Dallas after the assassination. There were plans to send him to Dallas a month before the assassination. Oh, my God. Somebody's lying here, man. Somebody is lying. Somebody got their facts incorrect at the very least or is lying at the very most. Okay, that's a wow. That means we're rest dependent probably telling the truth. Um, there is an evidence uh, that was gathered by an investigator named Harold Weisberg. There was a secret meeting of the Warren Commission. And Alan Dulles, the CIA guy who was the, kind of the head of the Warren Commission, said there was a document that said Oswald may have been a paid informant of the FBI. Alan Dulles said, I think this record ought to be destroyed. It was. However, a very a strong investigator, Harold Weisberg, knew that they had transcripts and tapes of, this, of these secret sessions. He got the tape, he got the transcript, and verified that Alan Dulles indeed had that document destroyed. So now let's go to another. Uh, there's a lot in Dallas, too, but I want to stick to the wows. These are revelations that just came out here. So I'm assuming that you've done your homework a little bit and read up on Oswald's behavior in New Orleans, Mexico City, allegedly, and Dallas. So there's an a anti-Castro Cuban named Antonio Vaciana. He's mentioned by Howard Hunt in his confession. Anti-Castro Cuban worked for the CIA ran uh, missions of these mercenaries that went into Cuba and attacked uh, Castro's Cuba in the 60s. He ran Alpha 66. Now he's 88 years old. And he said his main contact with the CIA was with David Phillips, David Atlee Phillips, who Hunt also mentioned. Uh, he said, um, I was uh, frequently met with him. He liked to meet in public places. He asked me to come to Dallas because that was kind of his home base for a while. But one time I met him and I, I, I met him in the tallest building in Dallas called the Southland Center. He liked to meet in, the, in public places in the lobby. And there he was talking to Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. This is a CIA agent who is at the same level as Howard Hunt, who is allegedly the man who planned the stuff that was happening in Daly Plaza. All right. Vessia, one of the documents that uh, Trump released shows that um, um, David Atlee Phillips paid Vessiana $273,000 in cash for services rendered. That's a document that came out in November. All right. But this is the thing that knocks your socks off. Uh, uh, Vesiana is 88 years old. Last year, in 2017, he writes his memoir. Everybody seems to write memoirs when they're 88. And here is, you got to read this slowly, because this, this changes everything you know about Lee Harvey Oswald. The lobby was busy, full of people, but I spotted him standing in a corner talking to a young, pallid, insubstantial man. He didn't speak when Bishop introduced him to me. By the way, David Atlee Phillips' name, his codename was Maurice Bishop. 
He didn't speak at all for the rest of the time we were together. He seemed shy and awkward, like he felt out of place. He attracted attention because he was trying so hard not to. I'm absolutely sure that Lee said nothing, not a word, not even hello. We shook hands, but he didn't talk. Bishop talked to me in vague general terms about the situation in Cuba. Finally, Bishop said something like, well, don't let us keep you, Lee. I'm sure you have other things to do. A teenage couple was coming in the glass doors of the building. I think it was one of their birthdays, and he remembers it, therefore, that it was September 6, 1963. The boy, Wynne Johnson, told me recently that he remembers it clearly, and after the assassination, he remembered Oswald, and he remembered the meeting of those three gentlemen. They said, where's there a coffee shop in the building? And one of the three gentlemen showed them. So you have to think about what that means. This is really earth-shattering. Um, Oswald is meeting with a CIA operative in Dallas. He has connections to the CIA. Now, David Attlee Phillips has been accused by a number of people of orchestrating the events in Daly Plaza. When I interviewed James Files, he said that uh, Phillips was his controller, and he was also Oswald's controller. So... Uh, of course, Phillips denied this his whole life, but just before he died, he admitted to his brother that he was indeed in Dallas. His brother hung up on him. So this really is very important information, and it's six months old. So, in late September 1963, Oswald is either going to one of two places. It's hard to imagine that he's going to two. One is that he goes to see a woman with two anti-Castro Cubans and uh, posing as a one of the three. And this is, now wait, this is a different story than Vesiana, so switch gears. Okay, here's another adventure in the story of Lee Harvey Oswald. And there are two that are very contradictory. And you may not know these, but it's important to know them. They're very, very essential. Let's do the Sylvia Odio story first. Two Cuban sisters are living in Dallas. Their father has been arrested by Castro. They don't like Castro, um, but they're, they're, they're kind of not, but not doing much politically. Um, and three men knock on their door in Dallas, late September, introducing themselves as Leopoldo, Angelo, and Leon Oswald. And they remember that that Leon Oswald was Lee Harvey Oswald when when they saw the assassination, they saw Oswald, Sylvia Odio fainted because she said, oh my God, that guy was in my apartment. Now, what were they doing in their apartment? They were saying, we're anti-Castro folks and we want to support organizations that are against Castro. And Leon Oswald didn't say much, but he was with two other men who are anti-Castro. Now that we've since identified them, one as Bernardo de Torres, an anti-Castro exile, and Angelo, Angelo Mercado. Bernardo de Torres' name is in Oswald's uh, address book. So there, there you go. Posing as an anti-Castro, I want to kill Castro type person. Now the other story is that uh, at almost the same time, Oswald is supposed to take a bus to Mexico City, goes to the Cuban consulate, knocks on their door and says, I need a visa to Russia. I need to get to Cuba. I need to get to Cuba so I can get to Russia. My family wants to return to Russia. He's a Marxist. He's done so much. Fair play for Cuba committee. All those things creates a big impression on both Soviet and Cuban consulate people. He goes to, he really makes up an impression that he's a Marxist and he wants to get out of the country. Okay, that certainly serves the Warren Commission well. So the Warren Commission heard the story of Sylvia Odio and uh, they didn't want to put it in the document because it was very compromising to the Mexico City story. All right, you can't go to Sylvia Odio's house in Dallas while you're going to Mexico City and making a noise in, in the uh, Cuban consulate. It's happening almost on the same weekend. So they said it was not Oswald, it was a man named Lauren Hall, a swashbuckling anti-Castro soldier of fortune. Okay, and that's why they didn't include it in the Warren Commission. <laughs> Lauren Hall said, hey folks, I've never met this lady. And this lady said, I never met him either. 
It really was Lee Harvey Oswald, not Lauren Hall. Sylvia and Annie Odio, 45 years later, are videotaped. They have not retracted the story. One night I opened the door for three men that came to see one of my sisters. I opened the door, they were in a small hallway with bright lights overhead. The taller man introduced the other two men. Leopoldo, he said that was his name. Um, he introduced the American who was in the middle as Leon Oswell, and he introduced the one that seemed Mexican and spoke with a Mexican accent as Angelo. And are you quite clear about it, that when those men visited your apartment, the American was introduced as Oswald? The American was introduced as Leon Oswald. That would always be in my mind very clearly. I think it was two days after that, uh, Leopoldo, who had clearly a Cuban accent, called me on the phone. And uh... Now, Leopoldo actually said on the phone, not in Oswald's presence, what did you think of the American? You know, that guy is a marksman from the Marines, and he could shoot Castro, but you know, he could also shoot Kennedy. So he planted the seed in Sylvia Odio's mind that this guy could actually kill the president, too. So Oswald is becoming a very mysterious figure who is a Marxist socialist hanging out with right-wing anti-Castro Cubans, and it becomes really hard to put all this together. So let's take a little look about the scam, the, the, the Mexico City scam, and the setup to frame Oswald. Here's a Marxist-Leninist making a lot of stink in Mexico, and um, there's a problem there, though. J. Edgar Hoover who may not have been in on this entire plan. Uh, Hoover was gay, and, who, and you didn't say you were gay very much in those days. He was the next-door neighbor of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon Johnson knew about Hoover and his uh, lifetime, longtime companion. Uh, whatever, Hoover was very uh, solicitous of LBJ, and he's talking to him on a recorded conversation after the assassination. And he says, we have up here a tape and a photograph of the man who is at the Soviet embassy using Oswald's name. There's a guy in Mexico City saying, I'm Lee Harvey Oswald. I want to go to, back to Russia. The picture and the tape do not correspond to this man's voice or his appearance. In other words, it appears that there is a second person who is at the Soviet embassy down there. Oswald is being impersonated. Okay. So that's from the, the words of J. Edgar Hoover. Warren Commission never had any tapes or photographs that they ever got their hands on, but they apparently did exist. Now, Vesiana, there's a document about Ves Vesiana. I go, wow, this is amazing. Vesiana uh, is asked by David Phillips to bribe a couple to say they saw Oswald in Mexico City. He tried to bribe them but he was unsuccessful in doing that. That's, a, that's new information, November 2017. Okay, there's the document number if you ever want to look it up. All the document numbers are in my book. So now let's ask ourselves, what actually really happened in Daily Plaza? Okay, let's talk about the truth here. This is the name of this video, What Really Happened. So there's the De Daltex building you see there behind the depositor. Eugene Hale Braiding opens the doors to the offices for an assassination team. Nicoletti and Rosselli are, and are part of that team. Okay? Now, there are two other figures I mentioned in the book, but not here. General Cabell was an, a CIA general who was fired by Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs. He didn't like Kennedy at all. Okay, he's perhaps one of the plotters. He had a brother named Earl who just happened to be the mayor of Dallas. Now, a document comes through to me through uh, no, in November. Earl is also a CIA asset. No one knew that until d November. And Sheriff Decker. Now, the three of those guys, I believe, somebody said, we're going to have 125 sheriff's deputies stand down from the protection of the presidential motorcade. Because that, they said the Secret Service said we should stand down. So they stood down. <laughs> there was very little protection. In the meantime, there are three other assassins, Richard Kane, 
John Sutra or David Morales and or David Morales from the CIA. And where these guys are, probably inside the depository. Very weak evidence, but there's very weak evidence Oswald was firing from the 642. One witness. So Johnson uh, is in charge of the, of the trip, and he has the presidential protection detail reduced when they get to Dallas. The top picture is a picture of the presidential motorcade in Houston before they got to Dallas. There are six motorcycle patrolmen, two on each side of the presidential carriage. But when they get to Dallas, Johnson orders the motorcycles to be reduced in number and has they should be riding at by at the rear bumper. So that gives a complete open shot to whoever wants to shoot the president. Nobody there to interfere with the shot. Nobody on either the left or the right side of the presidential limousine. So Johnson changes the motorcade. Notice that after he's hit, Jackie's reaching backward. But look at the motorcycle patrolman. They're doing what they're told. They're at the rear bumper. And there are no motorcycle patrolmen on the sides of that car. So the grassy old gunman is James Files. I interviewed him over the course of 10 years. I would send him an email, I'm not an, I'm a letter, and two months later he would reply. I would send him trick questions because a lot of people said he was a liar. And I would ask, do you know this guy? And I'd just make up the name to think if he was just going to BS his way through. He didn't fall for anything that I sent him. Everything he said seemed to be totally within reason. Okay, and I'm very conscious of the fact that many people say John, James Files is a liar. So Files said his job was backup. He was waiting for Kennedy to be hit, and his job was to fire at Kennedy if he had not been hit in the head. So he's at the grassy knoll, 35 meters from John Kennedy, and he fires because he doesn't see Kennedy hit in the head. And so when he hits Kennedy, Kennedy falls violently backward. Now, a blow-up of frame 313 of the Zapruder film shows that he's using a frangible mercury round that explodes on impact. It hits Kennedy in the right temple, and the a motorcycle patrolman behind Kennedy said, I was covered by a bucket of blood. Behind. Hit in the front. Everything goes behind. All right? Ten feet behind. Now... That's not what the media said, okay? So uh, Dan Rather's a young correspondent. He's making a name for himself, covering it. Four people were allowed to watch the Zapruder film, and then it was closed down for 12 years. So Dan Rather is telling the American people about the Zapruder film, and he says the president was shot from behind and fell violently forward. Notice how Dan moves his head forward to show the shot came from behind by Lee up there behind the president. Okay, not true, Dan. The president is hit in frame 313, and three-tenths of a second later, he, his head flies 10 inches backward, and he's falling backward, not forward, Dan. Now, Dan, in his memoir, 14 years later, said, I was wrong. Thank you. But by, by that time, everybody, all, the, all the, the, the busy bees got together and said, you see, the Warren Commission is telling us all the truth. But a lot of people who were not necessarily featured in the Warren Commission report said the shots came from the grassy knoll, okay? Uh, the majority said the shots came from the grassy knoll. Headshot seemed to come from the right front. It seemed to strike him here, and uh, his head went back, and it, all of the brain matter went out the back of the head. It was like a red halo, a red circle with bright matter in the middle of it. It just went like that. It, it was a, a terrible time. You cannot imagine seeing this. You, you knew it happened, but you didn't want to believe it. The particular headshot must have come from another direction besides behind him because the back of his head blew off and it doesn't make sense to be hit from the rear and still have your face intact. So he must have been hit from another position 
you know, possibly, you know, in the front or over to the side. I, I really don't know where. But the back of his head blew off. So I am very dead certain at least one shot, including the one that took the president's skull off, had to come from the right front. And I'll stand by that to my death, over my mother's grave. Well, James Files said uh, he was the one who did it. Okay. And you can look at the photographs. Again, not particularly featured in the Warren Commission, but people are definitely oriented towards the grassy knoll and running there, police and others. And uh, Files took his weapon, put it in his briefcase, picked it up, walked behind to, uh, to a car and picked up Rosselli and Nicoletti and off they went. Now, where in God's name was Oswald during all this? So that we, the, well, that's the lunchroom of the depository. And uh, there's a secretary in the depository who said she saw Oswald eating lunch at 12.15. Well, the president is killed at 12.30. And don't forget, the president is five minutes late. So Oswald is going to kill the President of the United States at 1225 when he's supposed to arrive, but he's having lunch at 1215, and he's going to go up to the sixth floor and then kill the President of the United States and run down and have a Coke, where a policeman is going to confront him drinking a Coke. And uh, they asked, was he winded? Because he must have run down all those stairs. Well, their book called The Girl on the Stairs, she ran down the stairs. She said, she didn't see anybody running down the stairs. Warren Commission timed it, said he had to run down those stairs. He must have been winded to get there that quick. He never was up there. He ate his lunch. He bought himself a Coke. Policeman came in and said, what are you doing here? Okay, maybe he stood in the doorway to watch President Kennedy, but he wasn't up there firing his weapon. Okay. And if he was, man, did this guy have cool that he was eating lunch and then thought, I think I'll run upstairs uh, and kill the president. I don't have to be standing there for a long period of time. I've got it all worked out. It's five, six minutes. I'll be up there. So or, I don't want to be too ridiculous here, but uh, there were a number of witnesses. 39% of the witnesses said they saw, heard shots from the depository. So if it wasn't Oswald, who was it? Okay, I mean, that is a question that conspiracists need to deal with. Well, we have a few candidates. Uh, G Sam Giancana, in his book, said Richard Kane with horned rimmed glasses, an ex executioner for the mafia. He was in the depository. Another possibility is this guy, Jean Sutra, the Corsican assassin, never mentioned by Giancana, but definitely mentioned by Howard Hunt, hired by... William Harvey, the man who actually came to Texas. But this is a wow. Okay, watch. I, I saw this and I said, oh my God, I can't believe this. French intelligence, this is withheld for 54 years. Okay, nobody knew about this for 54 years. And now we find out about it in November. French intelligence authorities requested we make inquiries Concerning the subject, a militant member of the anti de Gaulle terrorist group reportedly in the U.S. for a brief period in late 1963. Subject reportedly need, re, used names of Michael Rue or R Michael Murch. Uh, he uh, previously obtained information showing it was Michael Rue. He entered the United States November 19th in New York and he left on December 6th, from Laredo, Texas. There's a French assassin, comes to the United States, leaves uh, uh, 10 days, uh, two weeks after Kennedy's shot, out of Texas. Okay, thanks for telling us that, 54 years late. Okay, there was a French assassin in, the, in Texas at the time. Nice to know. A third possibility, is the CIA's favorite, the best assassin in the CIA, David Morales, who had dark skin, uh, who was uh, worked out of Angleton's office. David Morales always told the truth. He said, I was in Dallas when we got the son of a bitch, and I was in Los Angeles when we got the little bastard. Sorry, I'm swearing here, but uh, Morales talked like that. 
So there are three main suspects. Now let's talk about witnesses. James Worrell parks his motorcycle behind the motor, the depository. He said, I saw a man kind of rushing out of the depository about five feet seven to five ten. I had dark hair and a dark sports coat. Oswald didn't have a sports coat. So Worrell saw someone leaving the depository hurriedly. Richard Randolph Carr saw a man on the top floor of the depository with horned rim glasses. Well, who could that be? Later, he saw the same man in a hurry looking over his shoulder, leaving the depository. That's another interesting witness, is it not? And this witness I liked a lot here. He and his wife were standing there 10 minutes before Kennedy came. They looked up and they saw a dark complected man with a rifle in the depository window. And he thought that was a secret. She pointed out to his wife, see, that's the secret service. No, that's President Kennedy's assassin. Okay. Three witnesses. Interesting. So here are the most likely assassins who killed John F. Kennedy. Charles Nicoletti in the Deltex building, Richard Kane in the depository, James Files in the Grassy Knoll, David Morales, we don't know, probably depository. Johnny Rosselli didn't shoot. He was just there to see everything was working fine. Now, there was an acoustic analysis of, of Dick DeBelt with a, you've heard this story, a motorcycle patrolman's radio was on. They studied it. They discovered, they sent it out for two scientific investigations. The government said, no, no, no. But the it's likely there were five shots altogether, not three. So... With the Warren Commission on uh, having destroyed documents, altered documents, whitewashed this and that, we really can't trust evidence that has been supplied by the Warren Commission. If we grant that point, uh, then we have to ask who actually did shoot Officer Tippett uh, as Oswald was going towards the Texas theater. So there are a number of theories. James Files, I asked him that, and he said, I refuse to say it. Uh, well, I, he knew who the shooter was, but he refused to say. He did not rat on his friends or associates while they were alive. That's probably why he stayed alive. But he said that uh, this man had passed away, and one of his last wishes was that Files would not disclose it uh, because it would have impacted his children. But someone uh, uh, leaked this information. And the, here's how the story goes. Uh, Files' friend, uh, Gary Marlowe, tall, thin man. This is a picture of Files and Marlowe about 1963. Went to, uh, they were from Chicago, a part of the Giancana gang. And um, Marlowe's job was to take out Oswald after the assassination. And he messed it up. He was stopped by Officer Tippett, executed Tippett, left town, and it didn't finish the job. And that later on fell to Jack Ruby to silence Oswald. So that's how that story goes. But there are a few stories. Uh, uh, one lady uh, was not interviewed by the Warren Commission. She heard the shots of Officer Tippett. She came outside. She saw what she saw. She was scared off from testifying. And this is what this lady saw and said. And did you hear the shots? Yes, I heard the shots. And what did you do? I ran out into the street and looked down the street and... I ran back down the street where he was lying, and I looked at him. Now, when you heard the shots, and you went out of the house, did you see a man with a gun? Yes, I did. What was he doing? Oh, he was reloading it. When I said he was reloading his gun. And how would you describe that man? Well, he's kind of chunky. He's kind of heavy. He wasn't a very big man. Was he... Tall or short? Yeah, it's kind of short guy. Short and heavy? Yes. Well, they, they weren't together. They went this way from each other. The one down the shooting went this way. The other went straight down Pear Street that way. What was the, uh, the man who did not do the shooting, but the man who went in the other direction from the man with the gun? What was he wearing, if you remember? Well, I first I remember he had looked like light khakis and a white shirt. And was he tall or short? He was tall. And was he heavy or thin? He was thin. But the one who did the, the one who had the gun seconds after Tippett was shot, he was short. And yes, he was, heavy. he was short and kind of heavy. Now, 
Did you testify before the Warren Commission about this case? I am sitting in the one. Did anyone come to see you after the murder of Officer Tippett? Yes, he was a man who came. I don't know what he was. He came to my house and talked to me. But I don't know what he looked like a policeman to me. He did. Did he have a gun? Yes, he wore a gun. Mrs. Clemens, how long after Tippett was shot did this man with a gun come to visit you? About two, about two days. It was about two days. Said that I might get hurt. Uh, someone might hurt me if I would talk. About what you saw? What I saw. He just told me to be the best if I didn't say anything because I might get hurt. So there are uh, a few candidates here. There's, of course, Gary Marlowe, the tall, thin one associated with the Files story. Um, I discovered uh, Milwaukee Phil, who is another person kind of resembled a short, stocky man. He was a uh, executioner for Giancana and killed almost 14 people for the syndicate, murdered 14 people for the syndicate. Uh, his job was to keep an eye on Oswald. But he was. Uh, but in, in Gian Cana's book, he said that a CIA asset named Roscoe White, who became an, a sort of a, he was slipped into the Dallas Police Department for the assassination, and uh, Gian Cana says it was Roscoe White who took out Tip. So we don't have an answer to this question. Uh, we have suspects, and, um, and that's where we have to unfortunately leave it. But the question is. Why did uh, Oswald need to be killed? Why was this uh, effort being made? And then it fell to Jack Ruby to do that. Well, let's take a look at the reasons. First, uh, Oswald actually liked President Kennedy. He said nothing irritated me about President John Kennedy and a nice family. He had a coffee table book uh, about the Kennedys, he and Marina. He actually had remarked to a friend of his that he thought Kennedy was handsome and sincere compared to other kinds of politicians. No motive, no real motive. That's not going to look good in a trial. Secondly, he said he'd never been to Mexico except to Tijuana. Now, wait a minute, we can't have him testifying in court that he wasn't in Mexico City banging on the desks of the Cuban consulate and the Soviet embassy. Now, that, would be, that would not look good in court. Uh, Oswald was, after all, meeting with an FBI agent, Tabriz, and had meetings with David Phillips, and having that come out in a trial would certainly be devastating to the government's case, or to LBJ's case. <laughs> Fourthly, uh, Oswald actually had cooled on Marxism. He said, the way you're treating me, I may as well be in Russia. That's not a nice thing for a Marxist, Leninist, socialist, assassin to be saying. And then oh, they asked him, would you like to hide your face as they were dry, taking him from place to place? He said, why should I hide my face? I haven't done anything to be ashamed of. Oswald walks his last mile. His assailant moves in from the right. He's been shot. He's been shot. Hey, Oswald has been shot. So Jack Ruby is tasked with the assignment. Uh, and uh, shortly before Ruby's death, he died three years after this from a strange cancer. Um, he admitted to his jailer that uh, his job was to silence Oswald. And uh, he did his job. Of course, the Warren Commission said he was just a nightclub owner and that, that he shot Oswald so that Jackie Kennedy wouldn't have to come to Dallas to testify in court. And that sort of made it through all of the mainstream media but uh, what didn't make it through the mainstream media was that uh, Jack Ruby was mafia all the way. He was a courier for Al Capone. He knew Al Capone. He had nine prior arrests. Uh, he had made a whole bunch of long distance calls to some of the biggest mafia figures in the two months before the assassination. His first visitor in prison was a mafiosi named Joseph Campisi. So mafia's, uh, Ruby's mafia record is, is uh, amazing. Now, Ruby was in prison, and he actually indicted uh, Linda Johnson and said, because he was the one who was going to arrange the trip, the only one who gained by the shooting. So there's an autopsy in Parkland Hospital, and then they take the body by force away from Dallas to Bethesda, where they're going to do an official autopsy. But the doctors and nurses at Parkland Hospital said, 
they read the autopsy from Bethesda, and those wounds they describe in Bethesda were not the same as the wounds they saw in Parkland. And those are the medical professionals who who said, no way, the, the, the story that came out of the official autopsy did not correspond to what they experienced in Dallas. Getting on to a, different, a few different subjects. These are different chapters in my book. Dorothy Kilgallen, a gossip columnist, got scored a, a, uh, an interview with Jack Ruby alone in his jail cell. Wow. And she said, I got the scoop of the century. This is going to knock the socks off of everything we knew about the Kennedy assassination. She had a chapter. She showed it to her best friend, Florence Pritchard. And she was on television all the time. And she uh, died in her, uh, in her bed, fully clothed of barbiturate and alcohol poisoning. Her girlfriend, Florence Pritchard, died the same weekend. David Ferry was going to be indicted by the Attorney General of New Orleans, Jim Garrison, and the newspaper got hold of the fact that he was going to be charged with conspiracy to kill the President of the United States. He said, you know what that story does to me? I'm a dead man. From now on, believe me, I'm a dead man. You'll find out soon enough. You'll see. And within a very short time, David Ferry allegedly committed suicide, left two suicide notes, but died of natural causes. A mysterious death. And his good buddy, Eladio Del Val, an anti-Castro Cuban who said Kennedy should be killed, he died within 12 hours of David Ferry. And these deaths keep piling up. Gary Underhill said, Oswald is a patsy. They set him up. It's too much. The bastards have done something outrageous. They've killed the president. I have been listening and hearing things. I couldn't believe they got away with it, but they did. Underhill told friends that he feared for his life. I know who they are. That's the problem. They know I know. That's why I'm here. I can't live in New York. He was killed shortly afterwards. Okay. James Worrell, who saw it was on the motorcycle, died in a mysterious motorcycle accident at the age of 26. Um, Bruce Pitzer was charged with taking films of the Bethesda autopsy. There were rumors that he might have kept a couple of slides for himself. He retired as a young man and then um, committed suicide. Mary Pinchot Meyer, Kennedy's mistress, read the Warren Commission document and said, this is outrageous. And she was thinking of going public. Ten days later, she was shot in the head and in the heart, arrested. I mean, nobody ever convicted. And there were a lot of people who went to were supposed to testify in uh, uh, in the uh, in the mid seventies in the House Select Assassinations Committee. Sam Giancana was subpoenaed to testify. The day before he testified, he was shot six times around the mouth. Silence is golden. And all those murders you see, look at the dates between nineteen seventy six and nineteen seventy eight. Or most of these are mafiosi. Okay, so. There were articles about, oh, the, tri the odds are a trillion to one. There were about 70 people in the, in the table of mysterious deaths. But I'm a social scientist, so I decided, let's look at it differently. Let's look at cause of death and calculate some probabilities. So if you look at the people in this sample, the number of suicides is 10 times greater than it happens in the normal population. The number of murders is 20 times greater than in the general population. Na look at natural causes. The blue is the Kennedy sample. The number of people in the Kennedy sample who just died from natural causes, is in it's ridiculously small. This, the odds are absolutely incredible that something funny is going on. Murder Incorporated is going on. Now, Jackie Kennedy believed that LBJ killed her husband and Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy said if the truth were known about Dallas, there would be blood in the streets. Roger Stone said LBJ had it done, mob, Hoover, all in on it. Okay, so that's how this picture emerged. And you'll get more substance and more detail and more flesh on the bones in the book. There's LBJ. He insisted on being sworn in on the plane in on Texas soil. Yes, sir. And he was sworn in on the presidential aircraft. He commandeered the Air Force One right away. Albert Thomas standing behind him. 
And this is the most revealing wink of the 20th century. He turns to Albert Thomas. Albert Thomas winks at LBJ. Job well done. Well, that photograph has been excised from the photographic library in the Johnson Library. So this is the whole picture, or pretty much the whole picture. LBJ on top, CIA next, William Harvey, critical person, dealing with Russelli, who connects them to the Chicago, to the Mafia, okay? And the Mafia gives us three assassins, Nicoletti, Files, and Kane. In the meantime, we have two CIA functionaries, David Phillips and Howard Hunt, and they're greasing the wheels in New Orleans and Dallas. We don't know exactly what Howard Hunt did, but he did something. And they set up Oswald. He writes his letter to Mr. Hunt saying, I need to know more about what's happening. What's going to happen? What's going down? You know, tell me more before actions are taken concerning my position. And Hoover is there. We don't, uh, be, and Hoover is playing a major role in covering up all sorts of things, destroying documents and uh, not looking at Jack Ruby and hiding the mafia, which had pictures of Hoover in compromising sexual positions. It's all in the book. So I would like to uh, tell you uh, six stories that made me say, I got to write another book and made me say, I know that what I'm saying is right. These are the most important personal things. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer here uh, adjudicating a case. These are things that really moved me to believe that this is all true. Okay, so these are the most meaningful stories to me, if I could have just a moment. Of, the first is Oswald's Mr. Hunt letter, concerning his position. That means Oswald was involved with something and he didn't know what it was about 16 days before he was murdered. That is really important information. Okay, and that certainly moved me. Secondly, the Sylvia Odio story, these ladies are not lying. They're still telling the same story 50 years later. They're not writing any books. He was there at their apartment with right-wing anti-Castro exiles talking about killing Castro. And who he's involved with and why, we don't know. But he is not just the lone assassin who's working in the depository, who gets up one morning and says, I think tomorrow I'll kill the president. He had associates. The third one is Hoover's telephone call to LBJ, where he says, there's a guy here in Mexico who calls himself Oswald, and it isn't Oswald. It's not his voice, and it's not his picture. Now, that means Oswald's being set up in Mexico City. Regardless of what Gerald Posner and all these other folks say, it's the coming out of Hoover's own mouth. There's an imposter setting Oswald up. Give me a break. Okay? That, that, those are meaningful stories. Now, there are three more. The story of Eugene Dinkin and David Christensen, that to me, that moved me. These are two soldiers who hear CIA chatter about William Harvey, about Guy Bannister, about the assassination of the president, about it being blamed on a communist three weeks before it happened. Okay, that's amazing. And the fact that they didn't tell us that for 54 years is pretty incriminating, folks. Pretty incriminating. Jimmy, James Files, everybody says he's, uh, not everybody, a lot of people say he's a liar. One guy said James Files was not even in Dallas. He was watching his daughter being born in a Chicago hospital. I wrote to Files, I said, what do you say about that? He said, that's absolutely true, except my daughter was born in 1966, not 1963. Ha, okay, so I never caught him in a lie, but Files in 1940, this, this you haven't heard yet, so this is important. Another wow, the last wow. Files said, Johnny Rosselli flew from Washington, D.C. to Dallas. Okay. Uh, Trump releases a document ninth, uh, in November, and it says, and the FBI was following Rosselli. They said, Rosselli flew from, uh, I think I have this document here. Yeah, there you go. So this grainy document shows that uh, Rosselli flew on a private aircraft with two call girls to Phoenix, and the next day they were going to Washington, D.C. So the FBI places Rosselli in Washington, D.C. on November 17th. File says that Rosselli flew to Dallas from Washington, D.C. 
That is pretty accurate, James Files. Okay, he didn't know that the FBI, th this is new information that we just got, okay, about Rosselli's travels. Files had it right on the button, okay? Files is not lying. Now, the last document to me is very interesting. Jean Sutra's travel to the United States and Mexico revealed after 54 years, Howard Hunt names a Corsican assassin hired by uh, William Harvey. These are very, very convincing stories to me. If you have an open mind, you got to process this information. So here is my conclusion. All right. And uh, it's very controversial, but this is the conclusion that I think any reasonable per person would come to. President Johnson, aided and abetted by the CIA, conspired with and conscripted the American mafia to assassinate the President of the United States on November 22, 1963. The theory, if true, deeply undermines what common rank-and-file Americans believe. It violates every sacred canon that our country is transparent, open, democratic, civil, and governed by the rule of law. Instead, it portrays the United States of America as little short of a banana republic where power, guns, mobsters, murder, deceit, corruption, assassination, hitmen, and brazen coup d'etats determine the essential narrative of a people's history. That's the conclusion I would draw. So that's the end of the murder mystery. Everybody's dead. Almost everybody is dead. Jackie, Jack, Bobby, uh, Jim Garrison, San Traficanti, Nicoletti, Giancana, David Ferry, uh, Guy Bannister, David William Harvey, Jack Ruby, all gone. All the major principals are gone, except one person. Okay, the person who is still alive is the man who murdered President Kennedy. James Files hit John Kennedy with a single frangible bullet at, from a distance of 35 meters, which he said was an easy shot, and hit him in the right front temple and uh, killed him. He uh, was in prison for the attempted murder of policemen. He got out on parole. He lives in Illinois. I believe he has an unlisted phone number, and um, I believe he's planning to get married. James Files, the man who murdered John F. Kennedy. Thank you very much for watching.